Hello and welcome to this Yao interview. I'm very pleased to have Randy Xiao with me today. And uh, we're going to talk about your career path and what you find interesting in software and why you even ended in software. So welcome to you, Randy. Oh, thanks, I know. It's great to, great to be here. Great to talk with you. Likewise. And we already talked a while before the people started listening, but <laughs> this is the crucial <laughs> part. Right, okay. so let's start from the beginning. Why software at all? Why not carpentry or music or something like that? Wow, that's great. So um, it's a particularly fun question for me because I never intended to be a software engineer. Um, my father was a PhD computer scientist uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and after his PhD, he went to work for Xerox PARC, the Palo Alto Research Center, where they invented Ethernet and object-oriented programming and Smalltalk and uh, the laser printer and the graphical user interface and the word processor. Uh, he didn't invent any of that stuff, but he invented some really early computer graphics things and uh, computer-based animation that won him an Emmy and an, and an Academy Award later in life. Um, so for, as a child growing up and like, uh, going with him to work, because like I would beg him to go to work on the weekends, you know, when I was six and play with the computers and, you know, draw spaceships and stuff on his computer graphics thing. And, and this, by the way, this is 1973 we're talking about. Um, uh, so I loved computers and I always loved math, but think about that. That's a tough, uh, that's tough to live up to, <laughs> if yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. so it actually never occurred to me that that would be my career path. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, I hate mm -hmm. that. No, but no, it was, just... you know, like that my dad was like world class at this thing. And so I'm going to do something else. Um, and the something else um, when I was in high school uh, came to be uh, international law. So mm -hmm. the thing I wanted to do was uh, go and be an international lawyer, bring peace to the world. Um, when I went to when I went to high school, it was uh, 1982 to 1986. So height of the Cold War, the US and the Soviet Union. I don't know, battling for supremacy with, you know, fire, uh, pointing uh, nuclear weapons at each other. And so one of the huge thing, one of the things that I wanted to do was, you know, get rid of that, work mm -hmm. on, work on all those things. Um, and so uh, when I went to university, I studied political science and international relations. And that was going to be my career trajectory. Um, but the fun, uh, like twist and all these, you know, if you look back on your own career, anybody, you'll find all these like weird twists that you wouldn't have expected and you end up in, you know, meeting a person or, you know, taking a job or all these crazy little twists and turns. Anyway, for me, the several of those, uh, there were several of those. Um, so uh, the university that I attended um, didn't have minors. So in the US uh, university system, most universities, you can take a major, that's your main course of study, and then you optionally could take a minor in something, you know, completely different, right? Um, and they didn't, at the time, uh, my university didn't offer that, but I did actually love computers and math, so I did want to study it in a serious way. Um, and the, my only option was to double major, so I, I, I studied both uh, the political science track and then also uh, mathematical and computational science. That becomes relevant <laughs> later. <laughs> later. Um, but, my, but that was never intended to be a career for me. I, my trajectory was uh, international law. Um, yeah. And then the other tw another twist was uh, after my second year there, my sophomore year, I was looking for internships over the summer. And my first choice of thing to do was to go work in the um, uh, Stanford Arms Control Center. So again, U.S. and Soviet, uh, you know, pointing uh, nuclear weapons at each other. Um, this was about arms control and tr and doing various diplomatic and other things to to get those uh, uh, stop that. Um, and physicists worked in there, and international relations people, and so on. Anyway, it, it was a big it was a big deal, you know, you know, of the time, and then also Stanford's uh, had some really great people, and you know, they didn't get back to me. They didn't get back to me. They didn't get back to me. Um, and my roommate was an, uh, a double E, so an a, a, um, electrical engineer. And uh, sometime in the spring, I think this was, um, I'm sitting there reading my political, one of my political science books and my roommate Stan turn, gets off the phone, he turns to me and he says, hey, do you know anybody who'd wanna take a, have a computer science, uh, have a computer software internship at Intel over the, over the summer uh, uh, because for reasons he got offered two. <laughs> ah. <laughs> so he already had taken one and yeah. then um, he just had that up extra. He had that he had an extra one, you know, in his in his back pocket. And and Stan and and I said, Well, I don't know, Stan, 
I would, uh, <laughs> you know, the arms control people aren't getting back to me. So I'd be happy because I was already taking, you know, some computer science courses and stuff. Anyway, long story short, I did take that internship, um, worked there for that summer after the second year, again, that summer, a summer after the third year. Then I actually worked uh, part time two days a week uh, during my senior year, my fourth year at university. Um, uh, all the way through. So again, without th those several, you know, completely weird random occurrences, I would never have gone on this trajectory. Okay, so now I graduate with a, with a political science degree and my trajectory is going to be going to law school, going to getting an international relations graduate degree and going into, you know, this foreign service or diplomatic corps or something like that. Um, and, but I didn't want to go straight to grad school. So instead I worked for a couple of years as a software engineer at Oracle. Mm -hmm. um, and then two years later, two years into that, I freak out everybody in my group where I said, okay, um, now I'm gonna go apply to law school and you know, see you later. And they were like, you're insane. And I said, yeah, but that's always been the plan as I've been telling you. Uh, so I did that. So I applied, you know, I took the, the exams and took a you know, preparatory course and all the things that you do. Um, so ultimately, um, uh, you know, got into a, a joint program of law and international relations with Stanford Law School and the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in, uh, in DC. Um, and it was going to be a four year dual degree, get a law degree and a, and a master's. Um, and I, you know, I was in that in that program and I did the first year, which was the year, uh, one of the years at law school. Um, and I found that I um, it was interested in learning the law, but it wasn't anywhere near as fun as software. <laughs> no. um, I mean, nowhere near as fun as software. Uh, and then what really clinched it for me was the internship that I took after my first year of, um, of the law school, which was a small office in Silicon Valley of a big New York law firm, which should have been the perfect job on all fronts. It was, you know, casual dress, get great clients, the people were really nice. I was the first in law school intern they'd ever had there. I mean, super tiny office. Um, so everything like tick, 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 everything would be, this would be the perfect internship, except I hated every moment of it. I mean, the people were great, but just the work was so boring. Um, you know, getting patents for com companies uh, and like doing bureaucratic infighting with the patent office was not going to be very fun. And so I was already planning my escape that whole summer. You know, what can I do to get out of this? And then it just became clear, you know what, this is not the right thing for me. I should go, I should, you know, declare defeat and go back to software. So thankfully, you know, my, uh, my group at, in, at uh, Oracle was uh, kind enough to, you know, take me back. Um, and the rest is, you know, the rest is history, I guess. Like I never looked back. I never, you know, did any other kind of law or international relations thing. Uh, I know enough to be dangerous in cocktail party conversations, but that's pretty much it. Um, and so, yeah, so from there, the trajectory was, um, you know, I worked at Oracle for seven years. Um, then I went to another company called Tumbleweed, which was a security software company for six years, ended up going public right before the dot-com bust. Um, and then uh, after that joined, uh, uh, joined eBay and uh, did that for seven years. And then a few other, I mean, a bunch of things after that, but I don't want to get ahead of your questioning. <laughs> no, but I was about to ask because you have been working with a lot of the big companies. So you already mentioned Oracle and eBay, but there are more, right? Yeah, sure. So I've, I've worked at Google. Um, I led engineering for Google App Engine, which is the platform as a service, um, uh, like Heroku or uh, Cloud Foundry or Engine Yard. Um, uh, yeah, I spent some time, I mean, I don't know if say big anymore, but uh, uh, Stitch Fix, the clothing retailer with all of uh, the huge amount of data science and machine learning in the United States, um, led engineering there for two years uh, up until um, we went public there, um, and then tried my hand at doing the same thing at WeWork. Um, and perhaps your your listeners will know that that didn't end in the same way, but um, but it was also a fun, fun learning experience. And a few other things along, I tried my hand at starting a startup with a, another eBay colleague and You've never heard of it, so you know that's that's how that went. But um, uh, I worked as a CTO of a gaming company for a while. Uh, I've done I've done a bunch of different things uh, over my career. So it was it was kind of lucky that you declared defeat and went back to software. Yeah, and I mean that's actually well, I was going to say that isn't how I phrased it. That is how I phrased it at the time. I'm honest. I'll be very yeah, honest. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely how it felt at the time because I'd been telling everybody since I was 13 years old what I was going to do. And here I am 10 years later. You know what? 
mom, dad, <laughs> everybody uh, that I know, uh, this thing that I've been saying I want to do, I decided I don't want to. Um, but I've never regretted that decision, never once. Um, software is the place for me. So I feel very lucky. I mean, again, so luck, all those like weird twists and turns, right? So random. Um, I feel very lucky to have found this career and this community also, you know, uh, where I've been able to just like, learn constantly. I've learned so much over the 30 years that I've been doing software, you know, it's great. Yeah, and I'm, I was thinking when you said that you wanted to study international law, that in a sense, because I know you most from the conferences as a speaker, international yeah. conferences, where you talk about things, where you communicate, you help people understand each other, you help people understand the operations, the architects, the leaders, everything like that. So in a, in a sense, I think it seems to me like you are actually an international lawyer, just for software. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, it's definitely, I mean, there's definitely nothing that you learn in your life that's not applicable in other, in other areas. So for me, um, yeah, I mean, one of the, re the reason why in high school I got all excited about this is because my thing in high school was doing speech and debate. So it was public speaking, you know, since I was 13, essentially. Um, and that practice, regardless of whether we were arguing about how to draw down the <laughs> nuclear arsenals or talking about, you know, software scalability or analytics or machine learning or something like that, you know, the, the speaking and the speaking skills, I guess, because it really is a learnable skill. Um, and also the, the practice at framing a problem, framing an argument um, in a very clear way. That's, a, that's again, that's a practiced skill. Um, and it, you know, it shows up in writing, it shows up in, uh, in speaking, um, and that's been hugely important. And then you know, the international part, like while I was in college, I lived in Berlin, I lived in Krakow. Like, and so for me, there's just the great joy, and thank you particularly, I know, the great joy of being part of these international conferences is not only going and sharing software stuff and hanging out with geeks all over the world, um, but also just traveling, if hope we can do this again, traveling to places ar around the world, new places to me, and ex just experiencing other places. Like that's always been a great joy for me, so. Yeah, well, we will definitely continue to invite you to our conferences, Randy, don't worry about that. <laughs> Thanks, I'll, I'll hold you to that. And yes, do that. And, and we're looking very much forward to actually making them in real life again. The online conferences works, but it's not the same. Anyway, so there's a lot of um, people who jumped on that DevOps train. And in the beginning, it was about, oh, the technology, all oh, the automation, and how can we make things faster? Then it was a lot about the culture. But then there was a book called Accelerate. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Are you ever, have you read it? Uh, I have read it. It's well thumbed. Uh, and, you know, I, I took no part in this. I just want to be super clear. Like, uh, and it's all Nicole and Jez and Jean. So Nicole Forsgren is the primary author. Um, you and I were chatting earlier. Uh, I, you know, there's been, I've been lucky to be a part of, I guess, what we call ourselves the DevOps community. It's, I would, it's not the name I would have given us, but, you know, whatever. It's the name we got. Um, but I've been really very fortunate to be part of that community and just learn so much from all these authors, but also a bunch of other people. Um, and it's helped me in every subsequent role. So in my current role, I've, I've returned to eBay as the um, VP of engineering and the chief architect. Um, and all the stuff that um, the Accelerate book essentially summarizes um, all these, you know, six, seven, eight years of learning from this community and summarizes it so clearly in the first part of the book. And in the second part of the book, it's, well, if you don't believe this stuff about you should do trunk based development and continuous delivery and have a loosely coupled architecture, if you don't believe in any of that stuff, the whole second part of the half of the book is the science behind why all the surveys of the 30,000 people that they've interviewed, like prove it if you see what I mean. And, you know, Nicole is just a world class at, um, as, as a scientist at, at doing that stuff and, and, and um, doing the research, but also um, clarifying it, stating it, you know, back to what I was saying before about crisply making an argument, like she's world class at that too. Anyway, my point there though is um, if there's one book, like if people haven't read that book, stop, pause this, <laughs> pause this video, go out Don't and get it. Us. Uh, don't listen to it. Go out, get it, read it. It's a you know, it's a quick read, couple hours, um, and then come back um, because it's it's a great summary of all the things that we broadly broadly the industry have learned how to do um, 
particularly over the last six or eight years, but really over the last 20 or 30 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a huge help for me in my current role, but, but has been in, in previous roles as well. Yeah, great. So after this little advertisement, so how much do you get for each book sold, Randy? Yeah, I, get, I, I only get the pleasure of knowing that, uh, uh, you know, that Nicole and Jez and Jean are getting their, uh, are getting their due. Um, no, seriously. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do I get out of the conference and stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know. Right, so my ending question to you, Randy, because we don't want to tire people's attention spans here, is what is the important thing to focus on now in software? What should we, what should yeah. we spend our energy on? What should we learn more about? Apart from yeah. the book? So, I mean, I think, you know, different companies are kind of at different levels of, of their trajectory. Um, but I will still say the vast majority of companies are still trying to learn how to do continuous delivery. And, you know, if I had to say one thing that really separates, you know, the people that are okay from the people that are great, it's that is a commitment to, you know, continuous improvement and a commitment to doing continuous delivery, which means, as I know you know, because you're nodding, it means automated tests all the way through. (laughs) It means a deployment pipeline. It means closing the loop in terms of uh, monitoring at the end of it, you know, continuously delivering software. And why is that important? It's because if you, no matter how, it doesn't matter how many great ideas you have, or you need to have great ideas and you need to be able to crystallize them and figure out how to, how to provide customer value. But if you can't deliver software to customers, none of that upstream stuff matters, right? It just all, you know, it's a, as if, if there's a pipeline, if you can imagine, you know, the product process is this pipeline of, we got this idea and then let's figure out how, how quickly we can get it to uh, get it in customer's hands and provide value. Um, and if you can't do that end part of it, the upstream part uh, doesn't work. Now, once you've got that end part, now let's start working on, <laughs> you know, making sure we have really good ideas, we can experiment more quickly, and you know, all those. It, it's all it's all tied together. Um, but if there's one thing that you don't, if you if you lack the ability to do continuous delivery, none of the other stuff matters. Which, to be honest, that's why they wrote the book. I mean, literally, yeah. you know. It's right. It's in there. Like, you know, this is all about software delivery. There's other books that talk to talk about, you know, how to do good product and how to do design and how to do experimentation and stuff. Um, but the reason why it was relevant to, to say that is because that's where I think the vet still the vast majority of companies uh, need to improve. So, um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how good your product is if, if, the, if the users don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and conversely, it doesn't, I mean, if your product's not very good, it doesn't matter how fast you deliver it. So it all has to be there. But yeah. again, you, you asked me what's the most important thing. And, and again, what I see in the companies that I've worked with and sort of consulted with and advised is it's that last mile that mm. more places are missing, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah. In a sense, I don't know why it reminds me of that cartoon from uh, Peanuts, you know, the Peanuts cartoon? Sure. What, so the main character, the one who's very shy and very much in love with the little red-haired girl, what's his name? Charlie Brown. Yes, yeah. Charlie Brown. He walks into, it's, it's Valentine's Day. He walks into a chocolate shop and he says to the lady in the chocolate shop, I'd like to buy a box of chocolate for a girl. And she said, right, what kind of chocolate do you want? And he says, it doesn't really matter because I never give it to her. I'm too afraid. <laughs> so, <laughs> Heartbreaking. In a sense, that's the same, right? If you... If you're never going to give the customer the chocolate, who cares what kind of chocolate you've made? That's right. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's really right. And I think more companies are, again, like I say, more companies fail at that software delivery end of the spectrum than they fail at the vision, thinking about product, et cetera. You know? mm. yeah. yeah. So with that sad story, let's end our interview. Thank you for your time, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to talk with you as always, I know. Take care. Likewise. See you at a conference real soon. Yes, I sure hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. Bye.